I want to ask you first about the news of the day. We have seen um, this energy crisis in the United States, Texas power going out, rolling blackouts. What do you make of all this? Of course, the crisis today in Texas is something that hasn't been seen before. I mean, for uh, Texas to get, uh, you know, the temperature they have and the snow and the ice and so on is something unheard of. I think this is a, is a, is a one-time event in, you know, a few centuries, I think, or at least a few decades, we've not seen something like that. I personally lived in Texas for, for some time, uh, so I know that they are not used to snow. And, of course, all the facilities and, and uh, everything around the oil and gas you know, infrastructure is not set up in that area. Maybe in the north they are, but not in the south. So uh, it's a temporary thing, and hopefully they'll get things back uh, to normal soon. But it did disrupt, uh, you know, the oil uh, market, especially in that region. So you, think I, I wish go, them, you think it'll go away? It will yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Eventually. I'm sure they're very resilient. I mean, the oil and gas industry in the U.S. is very resilient, and, and um, I'm sure they'll get over it soon. Well, you're about to undertake, uh, as head of QP and Energy Minister of Qatar, a massive expansion of uh, the country's LNG capacity. Explain to me, uh, you had this on the books for a long time, um, but it was delayed just slightly as we with the coronavirus. Why now? How does this work out as an investment and a market thesis? Uh, as far as the Northfield uh, expansion uh, projects, we have uh, two projects, Northfield East, which we just announced uh, sanctioning, and the Northfield South. So the Northfield East would take us from 77 million tons to 110 million tons per annum. And then Northfield South, which we will announce uh, early next year, uh, will take us to 126 million tons. We've announced our strategy. Our strategy is very clear and, and is defined. These are very robust uh, projects. We uh, we just mentioned uh, last week uh, that the total project cost for uh, Northfield uh, East is $28.75 billion uh, for, to produce 32 million uh, tons per annum of LNG by 2025. This is one of the most competitive, if not the com most competitive project on the planet today. And uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, we're moving ahead uh, for our long-term vision of, of reaching 126 and maybe uh, more. Uh, one more on, on the expansion. Um, you're inviting uh, international oil companies to bid for up to 30% typically uh, of this project. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are you looking to see as you evaluate these bids? What's exciting to you? Yeah, what what we did is is very unique this time in Qatar. We had never gone into uh, you know, we had never gone 100% QP uh, in the past. Uh, now we have sanctioned this project as 100% QP. But we like the joint venture model where we have <clears throat> international uh, companies join us in, in developing these projects. But we already uh, are proceeding as 100%. And we're inviting them, we had invited them for, for some time, you know, to, to come in uh, to this project. But what happened uh, at the end is everybody had different capital cost assumption, and we wanted to have certainty for, uh, for our uh, partners to come in and have certainty in the investment that they're coming into, and they understand exactly the capital cost and so on, and then they can come in and, and uh, actually compete to give us the best uh, bid. Uh. Would you offer them better terms as buyers of your LNG um, if if they come in as a part of the project? They would have to offer us better, oh, okay. uh, be, uh, they would have to, uh, I mean, as a buyer, they'd have to offer us a better deal for them to get, get a, uh, you know, a part of, of, of our uh, development. Our pro project is very robust. I mean, our project is, is one of the most robust projects at any uh, oil prices that you see. Even testing it at, you know, $20, it would, uh, it would be a viable project. Let's talk about some of your contracts. Uh, you'll have lots of new supply in order to sell to the market. You are a fan of long-term contracts, typically mm -hmm. linked to oil. Um, when you look philosophically at all the LNG that you're producing for the market, what percentage do you want uh, as long-term? What percentage do you want as short-term, tied to spot? And is there anything else? Are there, is there a third way as well? 
No, I, I think, you know, long term is, is, is the best approach. Uh, it's the best approach for both sides. It's the best approach for, for uh, the buyer. It's the best approach for the seller. It has uh, really certainty of, of uh, the demand that is, that is required. You understand what's required by each country for uh, their long term. They have some winter requirements uh, that are different than summer requirements. They have storage requirements and so on. So once you have a, a contract with, a, with a, a, a solid uh, you know, supplier like Qatar that has a proven track record over more than uh, 20 years of not missing a single cargo for any customer, Okay, then you have certainty of supply. And these are all tied, or the majority are tied, with very essential power projects that have uh, you know, a, a national security element uh, of supply uh, for the country. And, and, and uh, we may, we, I, I think a lot of the countries would, would look at long-term stability as something that's important. There is this fallacy that, that, uh, that uh, LNG is, is traded like a commodity and, and uh, that you can, you can just have spot market, uh, almost endless spot market and so on. It's not true. And it was was proven just by two, uh, I think, of the plans coming uh, offline for uh, inter technical interruptions that normally happen in any plant where you saw, uh, you know, gas prices skyrocketed to, uh, you know, more than 30. I mean, we had gas prices that are that were close to two dollars because of the pandemic last year, and this year we had uh, gas prices close to uh, or more than thirty dollars, and and that instability in the market and big spikes are not good for uh, the buyer or uh, the seller. So I think to answer uh, your question, I think ten percent or thereabouts of our. Uh, uh, production to be in spot would be something reasonable. We would not want to, but we would be uh, capable of doing either. There are some analysts who believe that the demand for natural gas is going to peak somewhere around 2035. Um, I'm guessing that's not your view. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, the peak oil uh, was, was discussed maybe 20 or 30 years ago, where they thought that the peak oil is coming much sooner uh, than, than uh, you know, I mean, it's already passed, I think, in some analysts 20 years ago, we already should have peaked and are coming down, which didn't happen. Uh, and and uh, I think there is, you see, the, for, for what we require in the future, there is a definite requirement to move to cleaner fuel. And there is a transition that's happening. And, and I think renewable are going to be a big part of the future. There is absolutely no doubt. And I think we owe, we owe it to the world and to our children uh, to be more responsible in what we do and how we do it in the future. So that's, uh, that's definitely uh, something that I believe in uh, very strongly. Uh, what what uh, is required, I think, for you to go to a transition to something that's that's really unknown to be fully um, uh, renewable is is almost impossible because of the intermittence of renewable. I mean, when you talk about wind, wind is not going to be there all the time, and it's not going to be there in every uh, country. If you talk about sun, it's not going to be. It's going to be available in Qatar 365 days, but not everywhere else. Uh, so, so uh, renewable, renewable is something uh, that that will definitely happen. We're doing a lot of renewable ourselves, but I think you need gas uh, to complement that. So, I think gas uh, really is is sort of in a Catholic marriage with renewable in my view. <laughs> okay. yeah. So they would they would need to stay together for a very long time uh, for you for you to have the transition and to have it successfully. If you look at what you know people don't talk about today. 30% approximately of the world power is 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 actually fired by coal. Okay? If you take the Northfield expansion NFE project that we just sanctioned last week just the NFE, not the NFS. And you just take that project and you say, I'm going to replace that volume of gas to, to, to fire up uh, you know, uh, electric generation instead of coal. You actually reduce the CO2 emission in the world by 125 million tons per annum. That is equivalent to 25 million cars emissions in a year. 